Rome, the allegedly eternal city. Its very name conjures urbanism. But while Rome today is more likely to evoke the pleasures that reflect more than a millennium of catering to the tourist trade, its history reveals a very particular type of urbanism. You should think of Rome as an example, almost the archetype of an imperial city, a city of power, a city that grows great first by dominating its near neighbors and then by controlling the entire Mediterranean world, a city whose needs and pleasures were fed by conquest. Rome is hardly the only imperial city. Every pre-modern megacity was imperial, from Abbasid Baghdad to Tokugawa Edo, which is now modern Tokyo. In a simpler agricultural world, it was a lot easier to feed a million souls by forcing farmers to provide grain than by clever trading or industrious manufacturing. And that's how Rome grew. Rome's origins are, of course, the stuff of urban legend. One version, the Greek version, emphasizes Aeneas, the son of Aphrodite, who fled the fires of Troy with his aged father upon his back. His son, Ascanius, or Eulus, was the supposed ancestor of Julius Caesar himself. Or you may prefer the story of Romulus and Remus, the sons of Mars and a Latin princess. One archaeologist claims to have actually found the Lupercal Cave, the spot where those boys were suckled by a she-wolf on the Palatine Hill of Rome beneath the house of Livia, the wife of the Emperor Augustus. What we do know is that people, Romans, were living on that Palatine Hill three millennia ago. Hills were good spots for city building because they were defensible space. Height enables urbanites to see their enemies from afar and gives an advantage in battle. And Rome's hills also had proximity to a river, the Tiber. Early Rome was also defended by walls. The Servian Wall of the 4th century BC still exists. The advantage of sharing a wall creates a reason for crowding together. Infrastructure can be shared. According to myth, Romulus himself built a low wall for the city that Remus laughingly leaped over. Romulus killed him for his mockery. Moving from myth to history, we know that Romans gradually gained control over their region, over Latium, then over their peninsula, and ultimately over all of Europe. Lucius Junius Brutus overthrew the last Etruscan king of Rome in 509 BC and established the Roman Republic. This sturdy city survived a Gaulish sack in 390 BC. The Capitoline Hill was the redoubt that held out against the invaders. In 338 BC, Rome gained control over Latium, and for the next 50 years, the city-state fought to control the south of Italy what had been known as Magna Graecia, a Greek outpost. They finally defeated the fabled Spartan colony of Taranto in 272. The Greek cities of southern Italy had fallen to Rome's military might. By 146 BC, Rome had defeated Carthage, the Greek city-states, and the Near Eastern Seleucid Empire, a holdover from Alexander's conquests. The Mediterranean would henceforth be a Latin lake, not one for Greeks or Phoenicians. Rome gained control over the granaries of Spain and later Egypt, and that grain could feed the growing population of an imperial capital. At the core of Rome's population growth was strength abroad and weakness at home. The city's armies were capable of dominating the Mediterranean, but the aristocratic republic was increasingly forced to provide ordinary citizens of Rome with bread and circuses. One of the heroes of the last Carthaginian War had two ambitious sons, Tiberius and Gaius Gracchus, who were elected tribunes representatives of the poor Romans in 133 and 123 BC, respectively. They courted the support of their poorer neighbors by championing cheap grain for all the citizens of Rome. The Gracchi, of course, were eventually killed by their aristocratic opponents. It's a lot of killing in Roman history. But those opponents kept distributing grain, presumably fearing that hunger would be the fuel of urban revolt. Eventually, the Clodian Law made the grain distribution free. After fighting the social war, which sounds a bit like a battle with tea and crumpets, against its Italian neighbors, Rome ended up extending the rights of Roman citizenship to all the free residents of their peninsula. This meant that any Italian could get free grain, as long as they came to Rome. And come they did. The grain roll ultimately swelled to 320,000, and that figure is often used as a basis for estimating Rome's late Republic population, often thought to be about one million. Of course, the city could only provide grain for hundreds of thousands because it had conquered so much farmland, because that farmland had become the property of the state. The massed population of Rome created an enormous health hazard. There are always demons that come with density, and Rome addressed those demons with legendary feats of engineering. Roman aqueducts were a tool for bringing unpolluted water from low-density areas into the city. The Cloca Maxima, Rome's famed sewer system, was started by the Etruscan kings, Supposedly, it was the last of those kings, the one that Brutus overthrew, who started putting the sewers underground. Rome's imperial past shows in its architectural remnants. Columns, like Trajan's column, celebrate conquest. The magnificent sculptures that cover it 
tell the story of Trajan's defeat of Dacia. His men marched with order. Their discipline defeated the world. The column reminds everyone of what the emperor achieved. Livia's house atop the Palatine Hill reminds us that one family ruled over this great urban mass, and that family was able to enjoy comfort even while the larger city crowded together. Rome's evolution from republic to conquering empire also reminds us that cities are centers of political change and unrest. The late republic was positively teeming with political entrepreneurs like the Gracchi, eager to advance their station. Many rose through conquest, like Marius, Marius's nephew Julius Caesar, and Caesar's one-time ally and eventual enemy, Pompey the Great. Others rose through politics and oratory like Cicero. Crassus achieved greatness by acquiring great wealth. His private fire brigade would offer to save a burning building if and only if its residents sold him the property cheaply. His was the original fire sale. Eventually, the strength of Caesar's legions defeated the Republic's aristocratic oligarchy, and for five centuries, emperors ruled Rome. The great size of that empire led Diocletian in the third century to split it into west and east. The capital of the Eastern Empire would become Constantinople, which would last as the last great Roman city until 1453. The capital of the West, however, was moved from Rome to Mediolanum, or Milan, which had better placement militarily because of its proximity to the frontier, to the passes that run through the Alps. Rome began its long period of decline. Alaric and his Visigoths sacked the city in 410. Gesaric sacked it in 455. Recimer's own allegedly Roman troops sacked it yet again in 472. The city's population fell to a fraction of its former size. But Rome would have a second and third act. Constantine not only founded Constantinople, but helped make Rome a Christian empire. The Bishop of Rome would ultimately break with Constantine's heirs and their patriarchs in Constantinople. He would declare his independence as chief of the Roman Catholic Church. The wealth of that church, derived not from conquest, but from the contributions of the faithful, would rebuild a new city, a city centered on St. Peter's Basilica, not the Palatine Hill. And that city is highly visible today. That city of the church now coexists with a new, a third Rome, newly imperial, the political capital of a unified Italy since 1871. The Vittoriano, which sits atop the Piazza Venezia, the altar of the fatherland, symbolizes the victories of the Savoy kings which brought political prominence back to Rome. Those kings are now buried in the Pantheon, that ancient architectural legacy of Rome. It's apt, I think, to end on the Pantheon, which has been a Roman temple, a Catholic church, and a royal tomb a structural combination of all of Rome's history in one. Yet its beauty and remarkable dome has been an inspiration to architects and ordinary observers for centuries. It reminds us that just because a city is built on conquest doesn't mean that it can't bring enormous joy to millions. And so it is with Rome.